Welcome to Whiskey Lore. I'm Drew Hanish. Back in October, I had Lindsay reach out to me from BR Distilling Company, and she had sent me a press release saying that they had just won five gold medals at the 2020 Micro Liquor Spirits Award for their Blue Note Bourbon and their River Set Rye. I wasn't very familiar with the company, and they wanted to know if I wanted to interview their CEO, Macaulay Williams. But here's the thing. When I do episodes on Whiskey Lore and I do interviews, I always like to keep them history-focused. I want to be talking about some aspect of whiskey history, relating their whiskey to whiskey history, or find an owner who's really passionate about a certain part of history. Well, the name Blue Note did catch my attention because I'm a huge music fan, and when I get into listening to some classic jazz, some hard bop, that kind of, of jazz really going back into the, the history and, and, and digging out the old 78s, well, Blue Note is the label that brought us Thelonious Monk, Art Blakely, Wayne Shorter, Miles Davis did some work for them. And they, they've, they're still around. There's uh, Stanley Jordan is probably one of my favorite uh, musicians who's come out of Blue Note in the last 30 years or so. Well, the name of the whiskey did not come from the record label. The record label and the whiskey both earned their name through a particular tone that's heard in blues, jazz, and some rock music. The Blue Note is well actually i'll let i'll let macaulay cover that during the interview how about that now there's another thing that is associated with music here when i looked at the label for the whiskey it was called blue note juke joint well juke joint is definitely related to blues and it's also related to whiskey more specifically probably moonshine but there's that connection there with whiskey. And I love digging into music history just about as much as I love digging into whiskey history. So I thought, why not just pack up the car, head over to Memphis to be our distilling. We'll do a story episode around juke joints, blues, and whiskey. Well, as usual, I end up going down the rabbit hole and as I start thinking about it, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm really close to the Mississippi Delta. Why don't I just take a little impromptu trip in that direction and learn about blues music, search for the crossroads, and get into the history of the blues and juke joints in rural Mississippi? Well, it turned out to be a fantastic trip. It was short. I didn't get a lot of time, but I met some great people, some totally by surprise. And so I'm going to share some of that experience with you over the next week and a half. So here's what I have in store for you. Today, I'm going to share with you my conversation with BR Distilling's Macaulay Williams. And then later this week, we're going to jump into the history of Memphis, Juke Joints, and Beale Street with Jimmy Rout, who is the Shelby County, Tennessee historian. And then we'll next week go in to uh, my story episode about Juke Joints, the search for the crossroads, and a blues music mecca where you can still visit a real-life juke joint in Clarksdale, Mississippi. I'm going to tell you all about that. And then sometime after that, I'm going to do some sampling of the Blue Note and River Set whiskeys that Macaulay and his team were so nice to share with me. Unfortunately, I'm just recovering my senses from a bout with COVID. And when they say that you can lose your ability to smell and taste, well, I kept my taste but my sn the smell was uh, greatly deteriorated, and I discovered it not too long ago when I was doing a whiskey tasting, and I'm like, I can't smell anything. <laughs> so I am training my nose again. I'm probably about 30% back, but I want to give these whiskeys my full attention, so those will be coming up in a few weeks. So right now, let's go ahead and head to the warehouse at BR Distilling, and this is in Memphis, north side of Memphis. We're going to talk Blue Note in terms of whiskey and blues with Macaulay Williams. 
Yep, so welcome to BR Distilling Company. Okay. Founded in 2013. Formerly producers of Pyramid Vodka. There was a change in ownership in 2017 that I was involved in, and we then pivoted away entirely from making vodka to focus on making whiskey. Okay, nice. Um, and so was it in this space? In this same space. Okay. So I was an attorney for the company. I worked at the largest law firm here in the Southeast, practicing mergers and acquisitions and business law. And a buddy of mine had started the vodka distillery here, came to me with some issues <clears throat> with regards to their business plan. Uh, tried to help them ultimately, the shareholders voted to liquidate the company. Um, and I had been working on the project for about a year and just became really interested in the whole craft spirits world. And in my research realized that whiskey was really hot and I personally enjoyed whiskey, Tennessee whiskey and bourbons more than vodkas. Um, so came up with the idea, well, what if we uh, bought the company out of liquidation? Here's a fully licensed distillery sitting in liquidation effectively with the necessary assets and most importantly a license to mm -hmm. operate a distillery. So I went to some of my mentors and private equity clients, pitched them on the concept, we raised the money, bought the company out of liquidation and then and then I came on full time to run it and quit my job practicing law Very nice. to get into uh, the legal bootlegging business, right? Nice. So yes. I'm a recovering attorney, as I like to say. So it's interesting because I've been uh, running into a few attorneys here recently who <coughs> sure. have jumped into the, the whiskey business. How is that transition? It's a, it's a good transition. You know, it's a lot more fun than the billable hour working on a project. Now I just get to really focus on, you know, one project, this company and building it. Um, the legal background's been enormously helpful. Just there's obviously a lot of laws and regulations that go into uh, distilling and the distribution of alcohol. Yeah, you know, most of them stem back to the repeal of prohibition. Um, prohibition was so important for the industry for many reasons, but one of them relative to the law is just the laws that were put in place when prohibition was repealed, mm. namely the three-tiered system and the fact that the federal government gave it to the states to govern alcohol. So what you have is 50 different little countries effectively uh, right. and how they view it. So it's one of those areas of law where uh, the substance of the law um, sometimes doesn't match the form. There's just, it, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, form over substance, I guess is how I describe the law. So what, what lawyers would describe that as pretty, pretty silly or antiquated. Like it just, in this day and age, a lot of these uh, post prohibition laws are hard to justify yeah because the um, you know the wrong or the fear at which they were trying to cure in the 30s you know with the mob and organized crime and distribution of alcohol doesn't exist today right so they're a little arcane so <laughs> the background there is great and then my being a business lawyer really helped with just basic business formation and capital raising etc it's it's interesting seeing i actually did an episode around the 50 states of of whiskey and the mm -hmm. idea that every state that i lived in when i was younger had some odd rule about whiskey that was tied all the way back to prohibition and then tennessee it wasn't really until 2010 before things really loosened up here to be able to allow more than just Jack Daniels and uh, exactly. and George Dickel to be, and Pritchard came along in the 90s, but that was that was about it. Exactly, so, so with this company being formed in 2013, it was actually in that first wave of craft distillers uh, because the law went into effect. It was, uh, the movement happened in 2009, went into effect in 2010, obviously it takes most people a couple of years to get a business plan together, raise capital, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, prior to that law, it was illegal to distill alcohol unless you were within one of three state, three counties within the state. Mm -hmm. Those counties happened to be where Jack Daniels, George Dickel and Pritchard's were located. So they were effectively grandfathered in. And uh, once that law was repealed, that allowed for the emergence of craft distilling. And they're really similar laws all across the country, as I guess you found of where the manufacturer of alcohol was just flat out banned in some states or you know tailored in such a way that it grandfathered in some and prevented a huge barrier to entry for others right so when asked like why do we see so much of an emergence of craft distilling and in emerging brands that's a huge part of the reason because it just wasn't possible before that and then obviously there's all sorts of consumer shifts towards local products consumers desiring more complex flavor, more unique flavors, right. et cetera. But really the answer is, well, 
It was just flat out illegal, you know? <laughs> right. So um, one of the things that's going on right now, uh, big time, is this, the secondary market. And a lot of people are shipping alcohol around. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that you can't legally ship alcohol sure. without a license uh, around from, from place to place. So it's just this complexity and understanding you know what the laws are in one state versus another yeah I mean, you feel like you, you need a legal team to be able to just do a simple act like send a bottle of alcohol somewhere well a lot of people don't realize they call it the secondary market it's really the black market because like you pointed <laughs> out it is actually a secondary illegal trade um and then when that when that bottle crosses state lines it's now an interstate commerce and it's a federal issue um which all of that brings me to where i think we're going to see that law those laws loosening up in the future because it just doesn't make sense that you can't ship laws alcohol across state lines not only in the secondary market uh, I, I can see the justification for how that could be illegal because it's not regulated right but in the primary market like why why can we as a supplier not ship direct to consumer like wine right um and it's really interesting how you know beer wine and spirits are governed differently in many different states and Obviously, spirits have a higher alcohol content, so there is sort of a, a social uh, justice endeavor to prevent potential harm and alcoholism and alcohol poisoning with liquor. Yeah, you know, I, I see that, but then, but again, that seems sort of arcane. Um, if you can ship, you know, so if somebody really wants to get after a bottle of whatever, they're, they're going to do it with wine, beer, or spirit. It doesn't really matter what it is. But I think that's going to change. It, it would be great because I, I know dealing with uh, with sales taxes as a business owner. <laughs> It's, it's, all, it's very much the same thing. When you're dealing with 50 states and trying to figure out what one state's law is versus the other state's sure. law, it really kind of cripples the whole uh, industry, or in that case, uh, you know, interstate commerce and trying to figure out how to uh, run a business without having to, again, Definitely. have a massive in infrastructure of accountants and uh, legal people behind yeah. you to, to do it. So you come in here and you are taking over a place that was creating vodka. It was completely mothballed. This entire facility was empty other than a few pieces of equipment. Okay, so you're starting from scratch. So completely where scratch. do you start in developing out a whiskey business? Yeah, so um, the, the single, aside from just the licensure and legal perspective, getting into the actual substance of the business, the single biggest barrier to entry to this business is inventory. Mm -hmm. Inventory separates the haves and the have-nots in this business. Mostly because whiskey has to age. So it takes years to accumulate an aged stock of bourbon or, or rye whiskey or whatever whiskey product it is. So the first step was putting in place production contracts with larger distillers that could supply us with go-forward inventory. That was step one, which is its own difficult step because here I am, a recovering attorney. I was 28 years old at the time trying to go into these major distilleries and negotiate multi-million dollar inventory deals in an industry which I really knew nothing about. You know, right, I was reading right. everything I get my hands on, uh, was fortunate enough to make a few key connections really early on prior to even leaving the law firm to do this that, that were able to introduce me to a few of the big players on the distillation side. So we work with producers in Tennessee and Kentucky. We have laid down considerable inventory also with the distillery in Indiana. So none of those barrels are being used for our products today. Right now, we just use Tennessee and Kentucky products, uh, but we do want to expand our portfolio that will eventually include Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana products. Okay. Um, so step one is negotiating those. Step two was even, even those barrels we were producing, we were over a year out from launching our brand sales um, just due to designing the label, coming up with the brand name, signing distributing partners right all of that so we needed immediate revenue so i recognized that there was a need in the industry for barrel storage meaning other people that are participating in the bulk market that buy from distillery a they want to bring it to their facility but they don't have space in their facility to bring on the barrels yet but the distillery from which they bought the barrels has said but yeah you got to get them out of our facility right so there's this temporary intermediate home or, or temporary intermediate storage facility need within the industry. It's actually a much bigger need or problem within the industry than I realized. 
So I met a few folks that needed temporary storage. So I was like, well, if I'm bringing in some barrels from, from that group anyways, why don't you send me all of yours and I'll charge you the, the industry standard, which are handling fees plus dead storage fees. So step two was setting up our um, third party storage business. And by setting up a third party storage business, not only do we get immediate cash flow from that, which was integral to our first years of operations in terms of our cash burn, but more importantly, it's what led us to uh, meet more and more folks within the industry. You know, this is a very connection driven industry as I'm sure you've gathered. And so someone you meet might have a better uh, merchant for buying glass or a better label supplier, or they might have inv excess inventory they're looking to sell, or they might want to buy some of our excess inventory, vice versa. Or they might have a great relationship with a distributor in some market that we want to go into, or a great reference for a marketing firm. All of these connections, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel, right? And I realized really early on these connections are going to be key. And I, I would attribute most of our success to date to our early recognition of needing to immerse ourselves in, within the industry and build out our network because mm -hmm. it's proven invaluable over the last three years. Yeah. It's, it's fun actually getting a chance to uh, wander around and, and talk a little bit about what you're doing. We're walking amongst many, many, many barrels. How do you keep all these barrels straight? Yeah, so well, forgive <laughs> our organization. We're a true you know, production and operation facility that's so we're not open to the public. Um, but yeah, we have a internal inventory management system. It's called Whiskey Systems. Uh -huh. These tags you see on the barrels. Yeah. Um, Whiskey Systems is kind of the, the industry standard software um, that's used to track the barrel. So on the, on the barrel, it would state uh, the, the origin, the actual distiller of okay. origin. It'll have their distilling license. But most importantly is it generates a serial number and barcode or unique barrel identifier. Right. That then we can fill into our system. We build a three-dimensional uh, storage or, or a storage account within the system that shows where every single barrel is. And then we can always scan or trace based on the serial number. Okay. So surprisingly enough, this is a brand new uh, system for the industry. Like normally you just track based on lot IDs. That's all you're federally required to. Uh-huh which is an alphanumeric system that states the year, month, and in, in, uh, number one through, or A through L, mm -hmm. and, then, and, then the date of the, and then the date of the month. So it's, it's, it's always kind of a little math puzzle when you're looking at an alphanumeric <laughs> system that's backwards just to, to remind yourself of what month it came from. So yeah. people obviously realize when you're managing thousands of barrels, uh, there's technologies come out that allows us to track it better. Yeah, so we use Whiskey Systems. They, they've been a great partner. Highly recommend them to anybody in the industry that's not using them. And the so, guy that managed uh, all of Sazerac or Buffalo Trace's inventory invented this system. Wow. And then went out on his own yeah. to, to sell the software out to other folks. <laughs> and they definitely have a lot of barrels that no they doubt. had to track in, in that uh, company. No so this is palletized. Yep. Rather than being a RIC system. So the, yep. RIC, the RICs being what you're traditionally used to seeing where you're rolling sure. them in and these are just sitting on big large pallets which seems to be a, a trend that's starting to grow in in the industry uh why why did you choose to do the palletized sure. versus building out a rick so, house although there are some purists or old school folks in the industry that claim that rick is somehow better for aging the whiskey there's no scientific evidence of that uh palletized is the modern method of aging whiskey it is more uh it's cheaper and more space efficient and it's less labor. Right. So a Rick, the Rick system was invented by Colonel E.H. Taylor in the late 1800s. And the whole purpose of a Rick system is so you can take one distillate, one inventory, put it on different floors, and then create multiple different brands with different flavor profiles due to the different temperatures on the different floor and the effect that temperature will have on the whiskey. Um, we are looking for more homogenized aging. We, we don't want our inventory of the same lots to taste drastically different within it. Mm -hmm. So it's a single story building, right? So the actual temperature from our bottom palette to the top palette is, does not vary, but like about a degree okay. or so. But but really and truly too, it's a space and, um, and cost thing, right? So if you're constantly rolling barrels in and out of ricks, just the sheer manpower that takes is exhausting. There's all sorts of stories of broken fingers and toes mm. with rolling the barrels. We can harness the power of a forklift to move our barrels once we get them on the pallets. Yeah. We store our barrels on four barrel pallets. Uh, a lot of folks use six barrel pallets. 
due to our ceiling constraints in this facility, we go four levels high. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, four barrels per pallet, four levels high, we're storing exactly one barrel per square foot. Okay. Because each one of these pallets is four feet by four feet, yeah. 16 square feet. We have 16 barrels sitting on 16 square feet of space. If we had taller ceilings, we would go up, we would use six barrel pallets. The math works out in order to, in order to get below at or below one barrel per square foot using six barrel pallets, you have to stack at least six levels high. Okay. Um, and because we can only go four high, uh, this makes no sense. And then also the weight of each one of these, you had know, around 500 pounds per barrel, um, with around 2000 pounds per pallet. Uh, that's, there's a different caliber of forklift that you would need to do the six barrel pallets and yeah. they're cheaper. So we, we started off with planning on doing a four par pallet, four barrel per pallet system. A lot of groups do that. I, d I have seen some groups that go as high as nine levels high on six barrel pallets. Um, yeah, so the pallets we're looking at now, I, we actually didn't design. These are not a good representation. I'd like to show you some of our pallets. Okay. Um, those are re that's a really poor design due to the cost of wood. Yeah. So one of the other very first things we did was design our very own pallets. Nice. These are our pallets. Okay. A lot less wood used, so they're cheaper. Uh huh. Um, but they are graded to hold thirteen thousand pounds. If we do the math, four barrels per pallet, four levels high. The bottom pallet in our facility is bearing around eight thousand pounds. So we have them graded to hold 13,000 pounds. That prevents them from warping over time. Uh, they're all made out of treated pine. Pine's a lot cheaper than uh, some of the hardwoods and it's just as strong. Hmm. And it took several months to design these things with a local pallet making factory. You can't just say, hey, I'll have the whiskey <laughs> barrel pallet, please. Cause as you saw, those ones that another group sent in to us, I think are a really inefficient design. They're cumbersome, they're too heavy, they're too expensive. Um, so getting our pallets down to below $25 a pallet was key. Yeah. Um, and they're, they are a capital expenditure because we can reuse them and depreciate them. There's some accounting things there too. Yeah. But there's a lot more thought that goes into a lot of this crap than people realize. People are just like, oh, you just whipped it. It's like, no, like this is this whole process. And oftentimes something as simple as a pallet can set you back months. We didn't think about that until we got into it. Right? Yeah. So. So where do you gain all of this knowledge? We, we talk about uh, distillers learning how to distill off of YouTube and, sure. and, you know, that. But, I mean, in terms of running a whole brand new business, yep. you know, based around whiskey and all the different thing, aspects that you have to learn to be able to do that properly right from the get-go. Yep. I mean, do you, did you well, have We learn any... it the hard way, right? So yeah. we learn it through trial and error, but also it's amazing how much information's out there on the internet and in books that you can read. Yeah. So before I got started, I went on Amazon, bought probably about 25 different books on whiskey and just read through all of them. And then the ones I liked, I would download them on Audible as well and then listen to them on tape driving to and from work. So just really became a student of the industry. And it's amazing how much information, even in some of the books you've read, is in there that an actual operator can pull out and use mm. that strategy. And then, you know, be like, oh, that's interesting. Let me do more research on that. Um, but as an attorney, I heard, I heard this described well. The, the skill of an attorney is the, a good attorney at least, is the ability to consume a huge volume of information and synthesize it down into a comprehensive, you know, written mm. argument. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, the attorney uh, is consuming huge volumes of information, synthesizing it into a, either a deal or a case, whatever they're doing, and then they forget it and they move on to the next. Right. It's just constant absorb, synthesize, spit out, and then forget, move on. For me, I've just been absorbing, synthesizing, and not moving on because we're focusing <laughs> on this. So it is a skill set. Nice. That, that translated well. But yeah, there, it's, a, it's an interesting industry because um, it's so old school. Like it's an industry that technology has yet to really uh, reform into the 21st century. So there's, it, there's this weird juxtaposition of 21st century technology, i.e. like our computer software systems with like 1600s technology, i.e. the barrels. <laughs> right. And um, so... I guess things are, are, are done so logically and methodically because they're just tried and true techniques from over the years that you really can become a, a fast student of the industry and absorb it you know, right. really fast through these books and, and countless online articles and YouTube videos, all that. So the other big hurdle that you have to get over is the idea of if you're going to have all of these, if you're going to start selling a whiskey, you have to create something that people are going to enjoy. Sure. 
and you also have your own uh, likes and dislikes. How do you how do you start getting into that world of being able to craft a whiskey for the general public yep. that's going to meet their needs and, and so taste through that third party storage business and through our working with other distilleries we, we've processed around forty five thousand barrels through this warehouse in three years of every different type of bourbon and american whiskey you can think of so we've had the opportunity to try pretty much everything that's out there nice so when it came to crafting our brand we were able to study what other people were using from their inventories you know obviously with their permission to taste their barrels or whatever and we learned what we liked and what we didn't like um, but really and truly the first step of creating a brand is it even it, it if you haven't figured out the distribution there's no reason to even start crafting a brand you mm. first have to figure out how in the hell are you gonna sell it through this three-tiered system and then figure out what you're gonna actually sell but I guess it's a chicken or the egg thing we we'd, we'd identified the flavor profile that we liked, which is we like the overall what I would call classic bourbon and rye flavors um, and our our kind of whole I don't know ethos brand ethos is about delivering the highest quality possible product for the most reasonable price not necessarily the cheapest price but the most right. reasonable price um, and never chill filtering because okay. uh, we identified really early like the fatty oils um, and that was an area that I think a lot of bigger groups compromise on because they're trying to stretch volume right uh, so we've never chill filtered nor do we have any intention to I mean may maybe one day we'll have some obscure whatever brand that's chill filtered but in any of our core SKUs that exist today we'll never chill filter them uh, but the distribution thing's the biggest hurdle when we go back to like the law and the biggest thing that the repeal of prohibition created it created the three-tiered system namely the uh, statutorily mandated distributor mm. so if we were making cheese or selling meat or making soda whatever other food product we would likely from a business perspective engage a distributor because we would self-distribute until we realized that we could no longer keep up with the demand of producing and distributing and that their you know, distributors serve their purpose. But in other food businesses, because you're not legally required to use a distributor, there's a whole lot more room for negotiating in terms of the rate, the, the fees that a distributor will charge. In our industry, because uh, there is effectively an oligopy, uh, a monopoly of a set group of people that control distribution, they are able to negotiate. You know, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy or that they conspire to keep prices high right. or anything like that. But over the time, there's been some industry standards set about what they charge. And they charge typically between 25 and 30%, mm. which is a very large fee for being the logistics arm. Yeah. In other food businesses, you charge like 10%. Right. Um, so first, you have to go find, you know, if they're going to charge you this much and they're going to be this important to your overall sales strategy, you really have to find if we want to go yeah we yeah. really have to find the right distributing partner uh -huh. that buys into your vision of your product your sales strategy your marketing strategy etc so early on we met with countless distributors in all our markets and that, that continues to be one of the biggest keys or really that will define our success is is finding the right distributing partner for each market that believes in our brand and will push up the product because they're effectively the gatekeeper right you could have the greatest brand in the entire world if you don't have a good distributing partner it's not going to go anywhere yeah so that's kind of more the business side and then from from the you know the product side again we found the profiles that we liked and then you have like the packaging and branding which mm -hmm. is kind of more the fun part of it right it's also the hardest to define because you really don't know what people will find successful we're here in memphis uh you know within a half mile to the banks of the mississippi river um, we think that that provides really unique aging climate for our barrels with the high humidity and the heat that's down here in the Delta, as we call it. So part of our company ethos or mantra is, you know, we are inherently a Memphis startup company. And so most of us are either from Memphis or have made Memphis our permanent home. I'm a lifelong Memphian and we take a whole lot of pride in our city. Mm -hmm. So when creating our brands, you know, cause we, we want to create jobs for Memphians through our production facility. We want to put Memphis on the map for producing really good whiskey products. Uh, so we wanted our brands to embody Memphis themes. So our two brands are Blue Note Bourbon and River Set Rye. Blue Note Bourbon is named after the blues that was born right here in Memphis, which we'll talk about. And then River Set Rye 
uh, features a riverboat, and that whole the whole story there is talking about how the riverboats and the river systems was the first distribution system, pre pre developed roads and interstates and railroads, because mm-hmm. you know, they put the barrels on the ships to ship them, you know, down the Ohio or the Missouri, but either way they'd come down the Mississippi, passing by Memphis on their way to New Orleans, and so we thought that was a cool story to tell there. But our flagship brand is Blue Note. We created that brand because we I was thinking about. Um, you know, what is the most quintessential Memphis thing? Or like, what has the city of Memphis produced that's most influenced our American society? And it became really clear we were debating, you know, we have the river, which is cool with the river set. We talked about barbecue and food, but it, it quickly became clear that our biggest contribution to American society is the music, mm-hmm. namely through blues music, which later gave birth to rock and roll. And there's elements of the blues found in almost every form of modern music whether it be modern country, R&B, soul, what have you, obviously rock and roll. And then when, when you really boil down to what those musicians picked up on from the blues, it was the blue note. Mm. So the blue notes were pioneered you know, here in the Mississippi Delta that gave birth to blues and also jazz music. You know, It's the troubled note. The, the note was created out of people who had not been classically trained to play certain instruments, listening to certain notes and coming up with their own way to play the instruments. It's, I guess, technically probably an improper way of playing the instrument. To me, the blue note's most most easily recognized for a non. Yeah, I'm not a musician. I love I love to consume yeah. uh, what they create. I love to listen to music, but I I, I can't carry a tune to save my life. Uh, but when studying it, 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 it's the easiest to look at on a guitar. And effectively, you can you can play a blue note, but you still have your finger on the previous chord that you plucked while you're already moving on to the next one. So it creates that twang or that 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 soulful feeling that you kind of feel in your bones yeah. about the blues yeah. music. And so when boiled down, that's what defines blues and also jazz music. But mostly, you know, we like to say it's mo- mostly what makes blues a unique genre of music. That's what the British invasion and later folks like even Elvis picked up on uh, when creating and pioneering rock and roll. So it seemed like that was a cool substantive name to hang our hat on for our brand. Um, and then there's the pretty cool double entendre of tasting notes and this whole idea of a troubled, melded note that is a blue note mm. being a combination of two notes. There's this combination of flavors that create a good whiskey. I was going to say, were you going to put a little funky note in, in the uh, <laughs> flavor profile to make it go, oh, that's not normally something I would taste in there. Yeah. But uh, So we do, have, we do have some plans for some further um, line extensions that will get a little funkier and fun. Yeah. The idea is trying, we're trying to build our portfolio around the more tried and true classic classic methodologies and then we can layer on or surround them with more fun nuanced niche releases uh to make the portfolio within the blue note family a little more comprehensive and complete but um what i recognize too is that there was a huge demand obviously for quality craft spirits um when i say craft i like to refer to it in terms of the quality of of the process and the authenticity and the unwillingness to compromise Mm -hmm. uh with scale so some people hear the word craft and think that it means hyper-local, um, small, mom and pop. When I use the word craft, I don't mean that at all. So yeah. we want to build national craft brands. We want Blue Note and Riverset and anything we do to one day achieve national distribution scale. But we wanted them to always be craft in the sense that we're never going to compromise our process uh, because ultimately that's how people buy it. But I realize there's this demand for craft whiskey products, quality whiskey products, and the, the craft folks, the smaller folks, the emerging startup companies uh, were not able to compete with the big guys on price. And so many of the products are frankly overpriced. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it seemed like there was some gaps forming on the shelves of where within certain price ranges, say like our Blue Note Juke Joint is at the 27 to $31 price range. Our target MSRP is $29.99. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very few emerging brands are able to hit that price point um, because they're selling that same quality of product for $40, $45. And I didn't see that as a, a viable long-term business model. You can only kind of hoodwink the consumer so many times before they realize they're going to do the analysis in their head, which I call the value equation, right. which is quality relative to price equals value. You know, consumers aren't dumb, right? They're going to figure that out. And so we want to maximize that ratio of quality to price, i.e. driving home the highest possible value to the consumer. So we realize there's some gaps for me on the shelves and we've created products to fill in those gaps. And to place like our Blue Note Premium Small Batch, 
is a nine year, 93 proof, you know, age dated product, non chill filtered that we retail for $49.99. There's all sorts of other products on the shelf in that same price range that are minimum age of two. Right. You know, so, um, so how did you come about 93 proof? Cause I noticed that, uh, it looks like your whole line is at 93. What was the, uh, sure. idea behind uh, hitting that as a, a proof point? Yeah. So it, it has sort of in its own way become our house proof. Uh, that we're sort of becoming known for. So we didn't want to chill filter our products, like I said. If you proof down whiskey below 90 proof, you get what's called flocking. Mm -hmm. um, so we knew we wanted to be above 90 for um, scientific, you know, product quality control reasons. But then also we found that above 90 was a sweet spot of where whiskey geeks or collectors or connoisseurs won't drink anything below 90. Right. But then also the general populace, those that are newer to whiskey, or maybe what I call the whiskey drinker, not necessarily the collector, more of like, you know, the Woodford Jack type drinker. Um, they, they're not going to drink something over 100. So we were playing around with various proof points between 90 and 100. We ultimately settled, but we, were, we really like 93 and 94 proof. You know, very, very subtle differences in the overall taste there. Um, and then we were looking at it and then it dawned on me that the blues were kind of born in the late 19 teens but really became popular in the 30s mm -hmm. and that's also when prohibition was repealed so the nine and the three is the century and the decade that blues were really emerging on the national scene ah, also in okay. so the it's an homage to the 1930s i guess nice was the thought but it was sort of happenstance that's how we like we like that and then since then every time we create a new product we always try it at 93 proof to see if we can ma maintain it to see if it works there yeah because sometimes it might fall flat but we found that with our three main skews blue note premium small batch blue note juke joint and our river set small batch that they really work at 93 proof so nice. it's kind of a fun happenstance that we kind of it just happened so coming up in the second half of our conversation we're going to head into the bottling hall and talk a little bit about if there are plans for getting a distillery up and running within the confines of the warehouse we'll also talk about memphis barbecue and some great culinary eats in the area and we might even stir up a little bit of controversy if you go on a tour or talk to a distiller in kentucky or tennessee you're likely to hear about limestone water and when we start talking about the aquifer in memphis and the quality of the water that comes from there Got a very interesting answer from Macaulay. Let's listen. It's relatively cheap water in that it's supplied to the city. We have a really special water system here. You'll any, hear any Memphian talk about it. It's been the subject of cases at the Supreme Court between the states as Arkansas and Mississippi have tried to effectively frack our water. Uh, nice. um, so it's been, it's been the, you know, the focal point of countless litigation. It's been at the center of countless business models from various industries. Um, but if you hear folks talk about their limestone water, um, that has to do with the calcium in it. And they say that that has, that helps somehow during the fermentation process. Yeah. You know, I, I just don't buy that for a second mm. because the best whiskey or the best, any product is going to be made with the purest water. And the gauntlet has been thrown. If you want to hear more about that and more of the interview, it is available to whiskey lore society members at patreon.com slash whiskey lore. And never fear, if you're not a member, it's just $5 to get in the door. You can listen to part two of this conversation, catch up on all the other bonus content that you've missed in the past. And thanks to Macaulay and his team for their time. Ian was nice enough to show me around and give me a couple of samples out of barrels, including some whiskey that came out of a barrel that used to store honey. And it's not quite as sweet as you would think, but definitely did have plenty of those honey notes in it and some other really interesting fascinating whiskeys they're working on over there with both the blue note and river set brands they're in about 14 markets right now and growing you can find out more by going to bluenotebourbon.com whiskey lore is a production of travel fuels life llc you can find show notes transcripts and more at whiskey-lore.com slash episodes i'm drew hannish and until next time Cheers and Slanjava.